Today we are continuing our last week lecture about uh, velocity analysis and then we are moving to stacking and migration. Last time we investigated velocity analysis and how we can estimate root mean square velocity for normal move out correction. Now we are going to continue our discussion speaking about the factors affecting or controlling seismic velocity. You know, we always say it's generally, generally speaking, we have the seismic velocity is increasing with depths. So what are the controlling factors for seismic velocity? The first one is the porosity. Porosity <coughs> is significant for the first 10 kilometer depths. Why? Because after approximately 10 kilometers, we do not have sedimentary uh, rocks. Uh, and if uh, there were sedimentary rocks, it, 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 uh, it is metamorphosed to uh, another type of rock, metamorphic rocks, and this type of rocks has no uh, porosity. So porosity is valid or controlling velocity for the first 10 kilometers. Then temperature. Then pressure, then the mineral composition. These are the main controlling factor. As you know, as we go deeper in depth, the weight, the weight of the layers becomes high and then the pressure is high then the porosity is low, and then we have some change in mineral composition, and also temperature increase with depth. So for typical values of seismic velocity for water, the typical velocity of water is 1.5 kilometer per second. The average continental crust, you know what's the meaning of continental crust? Yes. So what was the meaning of continental crust? <laughs> it's a continent. <laughs> yes, but uh, what if uh, you have continental crust not in continental areas? You don't understand what I'm saying. Sometimes you have continental crust in areas where there is no continents. So what is the characteristic between what's the characteristic difference between the continental crust and the oceanic crust? Density, yes, density is one of the factors, but from the uh, geological point of view, the continental crust, there is granites and uh, granitoids, but for oceanic crust, we only have basalt. Okay, so continental crust, the upper part is granite, granito granitoids, and then basalt. The oceanic crust is basalt. This is the main difference between the two. So sometimes this area was, in, in, in some geologic time, was a continent. But then it, it, it sank under the sea and is undergoing changes to, to become oceanic crust. There is relics, there is some continental crust still present, but not in, in, in the continents. 
or uh, meaning in the, in, the, in the continental areas known to us today. But historically, there were continents that sink down below uh, the waters. The average continental crust is 6.45 kilometers per second. The typical mantle velocity is about 8 kilometer meter per second. Between these two, there is discontinuity. Anybody remember what is the name of this discontinuity between the continent and the, the mantle? What's the mean? What's the name? Mohu, Mohu Revich, discontinuity, or uh, abbreviating it, Mohu discontinuity. Mohu, discontinuity between continental crust. Discontinuity means the velocity jump as a Mohu discontinuity. Okay. Here we have the case for sedimentary rocks. As you see, the velocity increase with depths. Why it's increasing with depths? Because as we going deeper, the, boros the, boros uh, the porosity is uh, decreased because of the heavy load above it. The velocity is decreased, and thus the density is increased. OK, so in sedimentary rock, there is general tendency of increasing velocity with depths. Okay, so sometimes when we are, uh, we are when we are studying or uh, making velocity analysis, we may uh, propose or assume normal, uh, sorry, uh, linear uh, velocity increase with depths as an approximation, or parabolic increase of velocity with depths. Now here we have another type of velocity, of velocity change with depth, which is linking the velocity with porosity and overpressure. Increase in pore pressure causes decrease in effective pressure and in seismic velocity. In case we have, say, hydrocarbon gas, uh, gas and this is under uh, pressure. The, the pressure of the gas is, is, is high due to the load and due to also the buoyancy because gas and oil are lower in density than water. So it is trapped. So there is bore pressure higher, which results in lower velocity. This is evident here from the record. Here, we have increase of velocity with depths. And then, when we have overpressure here, pore pressure is increasing. While the velocity is decreasing, the velocity itself is decreasing. This diagram, or this plot, represent and can be used for petrophysical analysis, well logging, I mean. Uh, the general uh, change with, uh, of velocity and porosity with depths. So, porosity decreases with depths due to increase in overburden and compaction. Empirical relationship between depths and porosity as is low. Relationship between the porosity and velocity is represented by this relation. One divided by Vm, which is the uh, matrix, uh, the measured uh, velocity equal rho density divided by uh, F, which is a bore, uh, velo bore uh, fluid uh, velocity, plus 1 minus phi. This V of R is the matrix or volumetric velocity. Because the sedimentary rocks is composed of the matrix, the hard part, and the bore, which is sometimes filled with water, with oil, with even with uh, air, so we, the, the, the overall velocity is related to this relation, the velocity of water, the, the velocity of the matrix itself, and the velocity of the fluids contained in the pore spaces. The 
This diagram shows the change of velocity, the B wave velocity with types of rocks in the crust and the mantle. As you see, tonight is the highest velocity, it's about 10, uh, 8 kilometers per second. Eclogite, dioxinite, <coughs> mafic garnet, granu granulite, horniblendite, gabbros, and so on, till we arrive at serpentinite, it's about uh, from 5 to 5.5 kilometer per second. Effect of pressure and temperature on seismic velocity. Competing effect of increasing temperature and increasing pressure with depths. Velocity goes down with increasing temperature, but up with increasing pressure. So, temperature and pressure have contra contradicting effect. Okay? Temperature, when increased, the velocity decreases. Okay? While when the, pressure, when the pressure increases, the velocity increases. When the pressure decreases, the velocity decreases. This is the typical seismic velocity of uh, seismic of some lithologic liso or sedimentary and uh, uh, igneous uh, units. We have petroleum between 4 to 4.5 kilo feet per second, water about 5 kilo feet per second, mud, shale, sandstone, coal, limestone. Now we are, we are increasing at limestone, dolomite increasing, gypsum, and, and hydrite, and then the igneous rocks. So what this diagram tells you, what this diagram tells you, what you can infer from this diagram. <coughs> yes. No, there is something important for us for interpreting velocity into lithology. What this diagram tell us. Yes, this is good. And there is something else we can infer, we can determine. This, the, what we can determine is that there, is, there are overlapping between the velocity, the velocities of the lithologic units. So I cannot rely on seismic velocity alone to convert seismic data into lithology. Why? Because, for example, here we have shales and sandstones. They are overlapping in the range between, say, 6 k feet per second to about, say, 12 or 13 k feet per second. So in this range, uh, suppose if I have 10 k feet per second, I cannot tell whether it is a shale or sandstone or even coal. There is no unique value for the velocity. And this is very important, very important for us. We cannot rely on seismic velocity obtained to move from seismic data into geologic data or lithologic data. That's why I need to conduct petrophysical or use other tools about the lithologic units of the area of study. Now, we are moving to stacking. We finished our velocity analysis, and now we make normal move-out correction. We made more normal move-out correction, and now we are going to stacking directly. But first, I have to ask myself, why I am doing stacking? Seismic reflection data, why 
stacking is because seismic reflection data often show bad signal to noise ratio. As I, tell, as I told you before, seismic reflection comes in the middle of seismic trace. There are later arrival of direct waves, later arrival of refracted waves. There are surface waves represented by ground roll. And also we have noise. So seismic reflection data comes in, in the middle or in, in, inside the seismic trace. So seismic reflection data often show bad signal to noise ratio not only because of the high amplitude of coherent energy of surface waves, because it's coherent. If you look at the seismic trace, seismic traces, you will find it's moving in trend. You can determine the trend of surface waves on the seismic traces you have. But also due to non-coherent noise as well. This is one point. Another point. In order to increase signal-to-noise ratio, CMB gather and sorting, then NMO correction, then stacking are the basic operation to do so. So to make this, we have to follow common midpoint gather, sorting, NMO correction, and then stacking. Then in stacking, the CMB gather traces are corrected for NMO, then some to give one single trace. So the result of stacking is that if I am having 48 fold, if I have 48 or 96 traces in a common midpoint gathering, I end up with one single trace. We have two types of stacking. The one we can say it would term it as horizontal stacking, in which we apply common midpoint, NMO correction, then adding traces together to get single trace for certain point in the subsurface, we hope. The other one is a vertical stacking, as you examine or experience vertical stacking in uh, Amelie course as the second level. We are hitting the ground several times at the same offset and then recording and then averaging what is the result the result is to increase the signal to noise ratio by averaging out the non-coherent noise is it okay this diagram show you how stacking works now I have collected or gathered CMB with offsets, and then I applied velocity analysis to obtain the best velocity, the root mean square velocity. This one is bad. You see the output is noisy record, and here also there is a noisy record, but this one we have big resulting due to the summation of the amplitude of the trace. This one, this diagram, show you how stacking works and the benefit of stacking, of having high amplitude at the output as a stack the trace relative to noise. Because noise, as we, say, we, we, we said before, are not coherent. So they, are, they will uh, come either uh, in, in destructive interference or even it will keep its amplitude. While the stacked amplitude is increased, say, 48 times, 96 times or so. This diagram illustrates CMB gather, velocity analysis, and stacking. So here we have, if you remember, this is a velocity spectrum. OK? This is a velocity spectrum. Here is the gathering, the CMB gather. And this one represents stacking. And these are the stacking velocity.
What are the problem or the drawbacks of stacking? We have we have two uh, we have one uh, sorry we have uh, one important problem is that reflection reflection of seismic energy depends on the angle of incidence. You heard about AVO, amplitude versus offset. The AVO is applied pre-stack. Why? Because it depends on the difference in the angle of incidence, which means the change in angle of incidence gives us information about the matrix, about the bore fluids contained in the lithologic unit. So, Reflection depends on the angle of incidence, which means change of the angle of incidence contains information about the lithology, fluid contents, and so on. And stacking, as you realize from common midpoint, then normal move out, we are averaging out the angle of incidence. Actually, we are averaging the angle of incidence. In this case, we are interested or we are get, get, uh, having information all, only at wave number equal uh, kx means horizontal wave number in the x direction equal zero. Okay? So other wave numbers are not included, which have good information that we are going to use somehow in the next section of this course. So one of the problem or the, the, ma the major problem of stacking is that we are losing some information about the lithology due to eliminating or averaging out the effect of angle of incidence. The averaging out of angle of incidence is similar to the situation in time domain when you are taking the average of the time series. When you, you are taking the average of the, of the time series, the time <coughs> series we are dealing with is harmonic. So when you take the average, you end up with the uh, time series at frequency f equal zero or the DC frequency. If you remember the part of the Fourier series, A null, which is the amplitude at DC frequency at f equal zero is obtained by taking the average of the whole series, of the whole time series, if you remember. Now, what will benefit from stacking is that reflections become clear to us that we can mark and we can then map the subsurface, okay? But we have some problem in, in this record. Can anybody realize what are the, the problems of this record? Now we have this record in front of you. You see, there is some problems here. The, does anybody have any idea? Can can think? Who? Yes, you were in KL. Okay, t tell us. Can you tell us? Anybody have any idea? Over. Over corrected. over corrected? No. Uh, to understand what you have in, in geophysics generally and in seismic section, you have to adopt, we have to remember your geologic knowledge about the subsurface. Okay? So for us geophysicists, we need to have fair to good knowledge about geology. 
so that we can say, oh yes, this is geologic, geologically acceptable, or this is not geologically acceptable. Can you see something like, like this? This hyperbola intersecting hyperbola? This, is this acceptable in geology? Do you, do you see this in geology? Yes, because in geology, we have situations, and, and clear, clear situation, we have either layers, uh, layering without any disturbance due to structure, or we may have syncline and, and declines, we may have faults, or composition of these. But what we are, what we are seeing here does not relate to any of this. Agree or disagree? Okay, you, can, you can't say for this, this is anticline. Because, so if this is anticline, for example, so the, what is this? It's not geologically reasonable. So one of our, what's, what, what, one of the most important points for us that we have good geologic knowledge about the subsurface. So these phenomena, all these phenomena are called diffraction. Diffraction. Yes. And we are going to have discussion about diffraction later in this lecture. I hope. One of the importance of stacking is that we are re reducing the data volume. So I'm sorting, say, 96 traces, making normal move out and then stacking, I end up with one trace. So I am shrinking or reducing the volume of the data. So this is one of the importance or the, the, the benefits from stacking. Now, we move to migration. Why we do need migration? Migration is, is needed because the situation in the subsurface is not as ideal as we assume when we make common midpoint, normal move out, stacking, sequence. It's not ideal. The subsurface is not, the interface or the reflector is not flat, horizontal interface. It's either dipping or even a regular interface. Thus, Thus, due to this irregularity, what we have, the common point we, we, we are thinking we have is not the actual one. So, in zero offset migration, this topic, we want to remove the wave phenomena so that our section resembles the shape of the subsurface. Thus, we can model the Earth more accurately. One of the wave phenomena problem is the diffraction of seismic waves. So, one of the effects that affect the data is the diffraction. I want, for this record, to put the data in its proper location. I want to remove the effect of diffraction and then move back to the diffracting point, mapping the diffracting point. So for diffraction problem, the statement of the problem is that in CMB NMO stacking sequence, 
we assume that all the traces are reflected on common point in the reflector. This is the case of four flat horizontal reflector, which is the ideal case. In reality, there are reflectors that may be dipping or regular. This is the common case for us because most of the uh, sedimentary or the Earth's uh, crust is affected by tectonic <coughs> movement. So this, this tectonic movement <coughs> is reflected by disturbing the flat layering of the sedimentary rocks, either by making folds or folds or other types of structures. Hence, the, the CMB gather doesn't represent single point in the reflector. Despite this problem, CMB NMO stacking sequence is considered a powerful tool for signal to noise ratio enhancement. You, you realize I am repeating signal to noise ratio enhancement. This is the address, this is the title of our class. What we are doing from the first day to the last day is to enhancing signal data. So, Migration is thus applied to solve this problem. One of the migration steps that, or uh, practices that are used to reduce the effect of uh, diffraction is the exploding reflector model. In the first diagram, We have dipping interface, and we have also the ideal case. We have zero offset here. The energy, the ray, moves incident perpendicular to the interface, and then reflected perpendicularly back and recorded as a phone at the same point. Okay, so this is called zero offset because both the source and the receiver coincide. They are at the same place. So, an exploding reflector model, we assume that we are putting the source at the reflector at this point. So, the source is here and the source is fired here and recorded up on the surface. Okay? with a velocity equal half the original velocity. The velocity using here is half the original velocity. If we are uh, arriving at, the, at a good estimate of velocity, so in, in uh, exploding reflector model, we use half this velocity. Why? Because you, we are using half the way, half the distance between the source and the receiver, because the ray moved down and then moved up. Now we are assuming that the source is down as a reflector and energy propagates from the reflector up directly to the, uh, to the surface recorded by the geophone as the right graph show. So in exploding reflector model, we are working on tracking the place of the shot at t, uh, at t equal zero time. Cool. Okay. Our objective now, what we are going to, 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 to see, that we, are want, we want to track this point at t equal zero for exploding reflector model. Okay. The right, the right one, the right hand one. At time equal t, where, where was the source? At t equal zero. Where is the source? And exploding. The source is at the reflector. So when I'm saying we are Tracing the source, does that mean, is mean I'm tracing 
this point on the reflector. So doing so for all points means that all the reflector is replaced or is imaged by series of exploding source along it. Okay? I don't think it's okay. The reflection coming from you is noisy and needs rectification. I, I don't think it's okay. Uh, I'm trying to give you an example. When, when you, you have idea about something, you know, a pathfinder in the desert, path, pathfinder, they use the traces to return to the original position or trace to find the source, to find the victim, to find the suspect, okay? Like, like the situation now for MH370. Uh, we are tracing all, you, you see the map? We are tracing, the, the, the plane was here and here, and we are saying, okay, the plane should be in this place or should be in, 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 in this place. So we are using concepts similar to this. Now we have record at this point, okay, and want to trace and to track where is the source responsible for this. If I define the place of this source, then I, I define point on the reflector. For successive traces, for successive offsets, I will define multi-points on the reflector. If this point on the reflector is at infinitesimally small distances or separations, then I am mapping or imaging the reflector. Is it okay now? Da? Da? No. Do you understand? That's what we are going to, to speak, but I'm now speaking about the concept. Is it okay for the concept now? Okay. By tracing in time domain to T uh, null, we can image the reflector by defining the places of the shot. The condition of T null, which is T at, at zero, is called the imaging condition. Kinematically, <coughs> kinematically means representing the, the phenomena in time and space. Okay? If I'm representing the phenomena in time and space, it's, also, it's called kinematic representation. Kinematically, zero offset section can be considered as a record of exploding reflector model. Okay. So this is the characteristic feature of a diffraction. And this is what we are going to finish our lecture today. Uh, here, I have this interface. And then I have, say, fault here. And then the interface, the reflector, is offset. This represents zero offset data we have. When the seismic energy uh, incident at this edge, it will diffract according to Huygens' principle. So this energy moves upward till it reaches the, the surface and being recorded by the, the G4. The result of this energy is the hyperpolar shape we, see, we saw in previous uh, sections.